Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome back to the UX Writers Meetup based in San Francisco and this time international. Uh, we're so happy to have everybody joining us today, whether it's morning where you are, whether it's evening. We're um, happy to see you. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm Catherine, and I just don't want to do a quick check. If you could um, hear me, just put a thumbs up. Great. Perfect. Um, so I'm Catherine. I'm the organizer of this meetup, and I also have Kirsten Forsberg with us. She is going to help moderate. Um, hey, Kirsten, and thanks for um, your help today as well. Um, I want to give a big shout out to Indeed. Indeed is our corporate sponsor, and they're um, sponsoring this with a Zoom session, and we've got Jason on tech support. So thank you, Jason, for helping us out. All right, um, we're really excited to have Mario here, but I have a couple of housekeeping things for you first off. So um, this session is being recorded. Just wanna let you know. Um, at the end of this session, we're gonna have about a 10 minute breakout. We'll, we'll put you in rooms, you do a really fun activity. That part of the session will not be recorded. Only the main session with uh, the main speaker is being recorded and we'll post that on our meetup and you'll get access to that later. Um, also, closed captioning is available. If you'd like to uh, use that, just click the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. All right, if you take a moment um, to look into chat, I'm going to post a, a, uh, a link. Um, so this is a link to the Slack workspace for the UX Writers Meetup group. And we want you to go ahead and join that Slack workspace if you haven't joined already, and then join the channel September 2020 Meetup discussion. I'm going to keep posting that link um, as we go along so that um, newcomers will have access to it. So you may want to um, introduce yourself there, have uh, maybe Slack open on your phone or in another monitor because there'll be some multitasking. And we'll use that workspace to um, uh, to share our ideas and questions and comments and things like that. And I promise I'm going to turn off my sound in a minute so all the beeping doesn't happen. Um, just a couple more things. Uh, by joining that Slack workspace, you agree to our online code of conduct. And um, that's really important to us. So take a, a moment to listen to the, uh, to sort of, to read the code of conduct that's posted there. All right, I think that is all for the housekeeping. Um, our presenter today is Mario Ferrer of Barcelona. You may know Mario from the world of UX writing. He's a rock star. Um, he's the founder and organizer of UX Writers Spain with uh, over 1,500 members so far and growing really rapidly. Mario teaches about UX writing. He, um, he writes about it. He speaks at conferences. He lives and breathes this. And so we're really excited. He has volunteered his time uh, to share some insights and thoughts with us today. So Mario, we're so happy to have you today. I'll let just let you take it away. Hola. Um, thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you, Kirsten, for having me, and thank you for all the community over there at the UX Writer San Francisco. So um, I'm going to start sharing my screen, and uh, let's roll. Okay. Perfect. So again, hola to wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining. Thank you for, for your time and for, for being here to listen to, to what I got to say today. Um, as, a Kirsten, as Catherine already said, I'm, I'm Mario. That right there, um, it's, that's my Twitter handle. So if you have any questions and if uh, you don't want to make them right now in public or you don't have time or you think about them later, please feel free to, to ask them. Um, um, I spend some time on Twitter from time to time, or if you just simply want to come in and chat about tacos, that's okay too. So before we start, I have a teeny tiny disclaimer. Someone sent me this screenshot from, from the Dash, from the UX Writers Collective um, newsletter, and that first line, I got to say, it, it really made me laugh. And for a second there, I even thought about changing the, the title for the talk. So thank you so much, Laura, for, for the kind words. However, just to clarify, I consider myself very lucky because I am not alone anymore. This right here is my wonderful team over at Skyscanner. So if you're here, 
welcome and thanks for coming folks. But today, I'm gonna to talk about the road that brought me here. So today I want to speak to you about what it takes to survive. I know it's a strong word, but that's how I feel. What it takes to survive for being like the only UX writer at a company. And to be completely honest with, with all of you, um, I did have a, a very solid idea of how I wanted to handle the subject. I was planning on telling you about processes and how to create interesting deliverables even like the age old question of how do we collaborate better with your product designers, your devs, your PMs. But then John Coleman happened. I saw this talk and he really made me think if you haven't seen this talk, please, 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 please right there is the URL. Take a screenshot, memorize it, write it down. Go have a look when you have time. Not right now. Cause right now we're here, but maybe later on. So at the beginning of his talk, what John says is most of the talks in our industry tend to focus only on like the, the big flashy wins. They rarely talk about mistakes and the times that they do is just basically up to set up the plot. And he's right. Because we're all terrified of, of failure of that word. We, we don't want people to know about it. And we sure as hell don't want to share it, right? However, everybody fails. And we do it constantly. But we often forget two main things. Number one, it's okay to make mistakes. Number two, we learn by making mistakes. Because that is how life teaches us. That's how we learn. I mean, especially the big ones, the ones that make you feel vulnerable, vulnerable, the ones that really make you feel seen. So that's why today, instead of giving you what I had planned to be sort of like a step-by-step -step guide or like 10 tips on how to survive being the sole UX writer at your company, I wanted to share my biggest mistakes and what I learned from them. And here's me hoping that you folks out there find them useful. Whew, scary. Here we go. So when I started at this, my team had never actually worked with a UX writer. So I was like, amazing. I'll, I'm, I'm going to go all in on this, right? I'm going to ram content first design into every single conversation that I have with my team because I thought that was the best way I could get included into the process. Now, I really don't have any pictures of these moments because who would? So I'll be using animal pictures because, you know, they're cuter. So have you ever tried this new approach? That quickly turned into my catchphrase. I honestly thought that I was going to revolutionize the way people worked because, well, they've never worked with a UX writer before. Oh boy, was I wrong? Because the truth is, I didn't have all the answers. I didn't have all the context. And I didn't know what they have already tried before. Because sometimes what you learn in your books, in your posts, in your talks, in your podcast, or even at class is not applicable. And for sure, all of that together is never applicable. Also, context, that changes from team to team, from company to company and from industry to industry. Of course, I was trying to help, at least that's how I saw it. But the problem was, I was so eager to help, I missed the little details. And then what I realized is changes take time. Adapting to a new role takes time. Adapting to a new team takes time. And for a team to adapt to a new person in a role that didn't exist there takes even more time. So as Lin-Manuel beautifully puts it, I learned to talk less and smile more because I realized it wasn't about me. It wasn't about Mario. It wasn't about what my skills could do. It was about them. And by them, I don't just mean the people who use our products, our users, but I also mean my team. Because think about it for a sec. 
we're always focusing so much on the people we're designing for, but we rarely think about the people we design with. So if you really want them, if you really want your people, your team to value your contributions, understand what they need first. It's about them. Ask all of the questions, especially the ones that you consider dumb questions. Because you know what? There is no such thing as a dumb question. And with all that info, tell them what your skills can help them to achieve their goals. It's the same process. You need to understand your users' needs before you design, right? Well, you also need to understand your team and your stakeholders' needs before you design. It's about them. This one was one of, one of the first ones and, and one that I'm particularly not very, not very proud of. Because when you switch from copywriting, which was my case, um, you're used to fighting for every single last word on that ad. And when you work <laughs> on an open plan office, which most of us in tech do, I didn't know that because coming from advertising, we had these little cubicles. Arguments can get messy. Obviously, now I realize that, of course, I could have taken that into a meeting room. And um, for sure, I should have lowered my voice. But that's not the point. The point is, of course, words are important. But you need to know when to pick your battles. Because in advertising, a tagline, that is set in stone. Boom. It goes. But this is product design. In product design, content is never done. And whoever tells you it's done, they're lying. Because we're always iterating. We're always trying to make something better. That's why I had to quickly learn that I needed to change my mindset. I had to start thinking like a designer. Not fall in love with my words, but how they fit into the broader solution. How they serve a purpose within the whole experience. And not only that single line of copy, which was the argument because I had to start going thinking from a single screen to considering a full flow. Because I wasn't there for a canned lion anymore. I wasn't there to win the awards. I was there to collaborate and to deliver the best possible experience for the people that used their product. Or a few years later, I stumbled upon what um, El Senor Scott Cuby defines beautifully in his book, Writing for Designers. And I'm going to read it. This quote for you is like, words are one of the most powerful and flexible design materials available. That right there gave me the explanation that I needed. Words are components, just like pixels. This is the crazy bit. Because they are part of a system that provides a solution. And therefore, it should be replaceable, reusable, and scalable. There's no room for falling in love here. That for me just changed everything. It changed my mindset and also my attitude against words. So my advice here is don't get hung up on your words. Kill your darlings. You'll be happier. Oh, this one. Yeah. Um, react on Zoom if you've been there with like a thumbs up or a clap because I know most of us have been there. I, I, I was new. I was more than excited to learn and work with a product design team for the first time. And I would say yes to every single project that landed on my desk. Because again, I was, I was eager to help everybody. And I was juggling more projects than I should or could. And I can't even juggle, so yeah. All because I wanted to have a seat at the table well, all the tables, I guess. I was obsessed because I thought that was the best way to get into key projects. I believe that was the only way for me to be perceived that I was providing value across the board for a company. And maybe, just maybe in the back of my head, I honestly thought that was the best and the quickest way to gain the respect for my team. 
My mom says, el que mucho abarca, poco aprieta, which is like a Mexican version of jack of all trades, master of none. And that was me. I was delivering. Oh boy, was I delivering. Like churros, I was delivering. But I was delivering subpar experiences because I didn't have the time to stop and think all of that in favor of just doing more and wanting people to like me. So what I learned over the years is that there is no such thing as an urgent request, except maybe if the system is down, then let's, let's take that loophole. There is no such thing as an urgent request because most of the times it's just bad planning. So, I had to learn to say no. And I know now that saying no is really, really uncomfortable. I can see like heads nodding. That's why I needed to learn new tools because we use tools for everything else. Why not using tools for saying no? So I was reading um, through Ed Campbell's book, Creativity Inc. And he mentions uh, the popsicle stick method. So when people would come up to me with requests, and obviously they would because I had created a habit within the team, I would show them my sprint and I would ask, okay, so I've allocated all my time or popsicle sticks to these projects. What do we need to drop to make this happen? When you integrate them into the process, most of the times people would agree that, oh yeah, you know what, they can wait they would see the reality, especially when you're the only one there, right? Empathy exercise right there. Other times I did have to escalate, but I quickly learned that saying no helps. And also that prioritization is the key to happiness. So think about it. You might not have a full view of all the roadmap. You may not have all the info from the business perspective, but there's something that you do have. You have metrics, you have KPIs, Use those to back up your decisions. And people, if all else fails, reach out, get help from your manager. Or maybe there's a figure inside your company that has more of a holistic view of your product. Say no, it's okay. This one. <laughs> so the story is we had just implemented push notifications at scale. This is old, this is before you and I we didn't know we could by default just say no to push. So everybody was getting push. And when I say everybody, I'm talking about millions and millions and millions of people across the globe were getting contacted right on the phone. So in the first week of rollout, I left out, hey, username, right there, smack at the beginning of a push notification sent to millions of people. And an email thread came tumbling down from like a very high exec level. And I promise you, I'll never forget that subject line. It was, who wrote this huge question? I cringed. I was breathing hard, you know, like that shoulder, like, <laughs> imagine a, a, a paper bag. And I thought, that's it. There goes my job. But the fact of the matter was, it wasn't about who wrote it. It was, how much of a deal, how much of a problem this really is, and what could we, again, team, do to solve it? Because when you work in digital products, it's a team effort, it's a team sport. We need to collaborate to improve, not find a, pin, a, a finger and who to point at it. And then, while I was having like my breakdown in my head, my manager came up to me and he gave me one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard. He told me, focus on solving the problem, not the problem itself. Let that sink in. Focus on solving the problem, not the problem itself. Because when you're stressed and you're nervous, like I was at that time, you can't really gauge how big the problem really is. And you sure as hell can think of a way to solve it. So this might be seem very silly, but trust me, sometimes the first thing you need to do is just breathe. Because this will allow you to stop and think 
and most importantly, be able to reach out for help. Because most of the times the problems will seem way, 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 way bigger than they really are. So try to, try to take that step back, try to breathe, try to look at it with a cold head and get all the help you can get. And maybe one day you'll think about it, you'll sigh like I just did, <sighs> remembering how you felt that day and share it because there might be people out there that are struggling with the same type of thing and that's helpful. Last but not least, this is by far the, um, the hardest lesson that I've learned. It, it basically changed the way I perceived myself. I was taking on too much. I thought I had to push myself harder and harder and harder. I had a full-time job, I had two kids, barely any sleep, but hey, I wasn't gonna let anything stop me because I was not going to quit. But then I let it get the best out of me and I burned out. So one day I, I was at the office and I called my wife shaking. And I remember that she told me with the sweetest voice she could, she just told me, you have to let it go. It's just a job. Your mental health is more important than this. Your family is more important than this. Your life is more important than this. And just like that, it made me realize I needed help. I needed to reframe things and I needed to start over again. Because it's okay to love your job. That's awesome. It's amazing to feel passionate about the projects you're working on. And yes, of course, we are lucky and we are privileged to do the type of work that we do. But as everything in life, you need to find a balance. You need to find that sweet spot. And don't ever, ever let your work burn you out. Because your well being and your mental health are always first. Reach out to the people that are surrounding you because they will be available to help. But if you don't reach out, if you don't speak up, they don't know that you're struggling. So let's recap what I wanted to share today. It's about them, about your team, the people you design with, and the people you design for. Wards are components. That means they should be replaceable, reusable, and scalable. Don't fall in love with them. Say no. That's it. That's a tweet. Breathe to help you focus on how to solve the problem and not the problem itself. And the work doesn't define you. Reach out and ask for help if you need to. Because you might be the only one, but you're not alone. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Mario. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'll stop sharing now. Um, I had to do some some audio visual changing things up. Um, thanks so much for that presentation, Mario. I know that a lot of that really resonated with me. Um, I will be uh, facilitating or moderating the Q&A. Um, there's a lot of participants and probably a lot of questions. So I've posted in the September 2020 discussion channel um, a post that if you have any questions, you can um, put a thread underneath so that way I can see them. Um, and then be the one who asks Mario the questions. So we'll have about 10, uh, a, a generous 10 minutes for questions. Um, I don't see any yet. So I have the luxury of asking you the first question. Um, so you, you've given us um, kind of five points to consider and to think about. Um, is any, do you feel like any, you know, we're, we're juggling all these things and including these things to consider? Um, do you feel like one, or I guess, how do you juggle um, like when to say no or when to let it go or um, how do you juggle all these things that you've just shared with us? That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Again, it's, it's prioritization, right? So um, every context is different. Every team is different. Every company is different. So you need to give it time. You need to see how things work and you need to know yourself. So sometimes maybe saying no is not an option. 
then you might need some help. So that's why you need to reach out to your manager. Sometimes uh, you don't have that much choice. Maybe you have to make this hard decision of stopping and thinking is like, is this the right job for me? Because again, no, no job out there. And I know it's, it sounds weird saying it's just a job, but it is, especially you folks out there in, in, in the Bay Area. I mean, you have everybody over there. You need to, you need to be okay with you to do the best that you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in your experience, um, kind of who have been your, um, like, like best allies or best resources within the different teams that you work with? Yeah. Okay. So, um, when you're the only one, uh, the first thing that you have to do is you have to bring cookies and you have to start <laughs> what I call the cookie tour. So there's always your manager or sometimes some companies have like, they give you a buddy. So the first thing you need to do is a list mm -hmm. of like the main contacts from each department that you should bring cookies to. So that's who's the lead designer on the project, who's the lead researcher, who's the lead PM, anybody that you know will help you. And why do I say lead? Because of course you'll do um, friendships and, and you'll do colleagues at your level, but you need to go a level up to understand a bit wider. And cookies, especially their chocolate chip, they always open the door because that'll, that'll give you a very nice point of conversation and you'll start understanding, again, what are the, the needs of all of those people. Once you have that gathered, then you can start sort of prioritizing how you want to do it. That makes sense. Um, tacos also work really well. Tacos also work, but they're messy. So that's <laughs> yeah. why sometimes cookies are easier. Yep. Um, I, I see a question from Val. Um, as the only UX writer at my company, I get a lot of, since you're so busy, why don't you teach the designers to write so you don't have to? Do you hear this as well? Did you find workshops or any other mentorship techniques to be effective? Yeah, yeah, de definitely. Th thanks, thanks Val for the for the question. Yes, I get this all the time. So it's depending on how you wanna how you wanna take this on. If your company has a design system, um, or you have some sort of guidelines, that's a great way to start because you shouldn't be writing like that CTA button thirty times a week. You should have that on the design system so they can just pull it in. Um, I definitely advise you to read Scott Kuby's Writing for Designers because he basically speaks about that because it's not about being busy because of course you are because you're the only one is about them understanding what goes into the job because when you write for a living they think because oh we all have a keyboard that's great i can write too but we all know writing is the last bit of what we do there's all this research all this design work all this talking to stakeholders that sometimes is not out there so you have to be very vocal about it so maybe yes running a workshop explaining what are the steps that you take sharing a little bit of your process that's also helpful and then obviously you need to prioritize. Now, this is a very nice leverage because if you're doing your job and people are coming more and more and more and more and they want more of, of what you do or to clone you, that's when you can go upstairs to your managers or, or your high-end stakeholders and say like, look, this is all the things I'm doing. But, and then you like on scroll the list, these are all the things we can't do because it's just me. Mm -hmm. What up? Yeah. That's the first step to start building a team. That makes sense and sounds good. Um, I see um, a question from Amy um, that has a couple of res replies already. Um, I learned in a previous job that saying no was not an option. I tried a version of the popsicle stick showing the workload I carried. What additional tips can you give on, uh, can you give on saying yes and, but that really means no. Okay, so like I was saying, when, when it's the popsicle stick, so when you share the responsibility of saying no, that's when it gets, it's get, it gets interesting. Because if you just go up to them and show them what you're working on, and you tell me, out of these five things that are based on our OKRs, and these are the weights, or this is what, however you do it at your company, out of these things, you tell me what has to go down. And that is very powerful because nobody wants to say, oh, yes, that thing is not as important as my thing. If they do, then you escalate. Um, other things that you can do is you can try to have, again, I don't know how your company is, is, is based or how, how your team works, but normally you have retros and normally you have stand-ups. So you need to understand how these people are prioritizing their things because you can't do the job of a PM plus your regular job. Reach out to whoever is the project manager or the product owner, depends on the company, and see what's the actual wiggle room and what are the things that have to have priority? So 
if you feel uncomfortable with saying no or you're having problems, is like the other solution is going like, I mean, I would say yes. I can't but, tell if I froze uh, or if you froze. Um, I think I'm moving. I think you froze. Yeah, Joseph is saying yes, so I'm good. There we go. You're back. Okay. Okay. I'm back. I couldn't tell if I froze there <laughs> or if you froze. It's fine. It's fine. If, if we froze, just let us know. Um, okay. Train of thought. Ah, yes. So if you at the beginning feel comfortable, or if you tried this before, you can go like, it's not me saying no. It's me plus X, Y, and Z because we've done a prioritization meeting beforehand. You need to reach out and you need to get help from people that have uh, um, a larger view of what the roadmap is to help you out. Um, a, a question from Matt about a follow-up to your cookie tip. Um, da, 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 now that many of us are remote instead of in-house, I can't just go by and you know drop someone, drop, bring cookies or tacos to the office. What are some ways you recommend we build those relationships that give us the social currency to say no, especially if you're adapting to a new manager or boss? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a good question, Matt. Thank you. Yes, obviously you can't bring cookies, but that doesn't mean you can't have a digital or a virtual coffee time. So, I mean, nobody's super busy that they can't dedicate to you at least once every two weeks, five, ten minutes, to just sit down and talk. And just do it fun, man. Do it at a time that... So, first tip is do it at a time that's not very um, work-heavy. Do it at a time that's not very meeting-heavy. So, normally it's beginning of the day when people are doing admin or like half the day when people are like right before or after their lunch. And, or, I mean, I don't know why, why not have lunch together? So what you wanna do is, since you can't do it physically, you wanna take off that barrier. When you share, and this comes from ancient times, when you share food with someone else, their barrier goes down. So they're much more open to listening to what you have to say. So it's like, hey, whoever it may be, why don't we grab a coffee? Go do your coffee, five minutes, well, and that's it. It's just a five minute chat and start talking about different things, but you need to understand what makes them tick to help them out. Yep, that's definitely or true. Send, or, or just send them a, a delivery or whatever is it that you have over there with cookies. I mean, I don't know. Depends on how bad it gets. <laughs> um, this is, uh, Darlisa had a question um, that I related a lot to. Um, sometimes it helps a lot to bounce ideas off of someone else, but if you're the only UX writer, content person, word person, um, sometimes there's nobody and people are busy sometimes. Um, do you have any tips on how to refine copy or advice on how to bounce ideas off of people when you're the only writer? That, that's, that's a very nice question. So I have, the, I have the complicated way, which I did, and I have like the easy way. So I'll give you the complicated way first is like I started UX Writers Spain because I was the only one and I needed someone to talk to. And I just started slacking people and then we have a huge slack where people come in and, and we do exactly this. They might not work in your industry, you might not be able to share the insights, but if it's for bouncing ideas and copy, that works fine. If you don't wanna create your own, you have UX writers here in San Francisco, you have lots of slack groups that have dedicated channels to just this. Just reach out, people are super nice. Nobody's gonna be policing or saying like, oh, you're a crappy writer. Oh my God, what did you do? No. They'll be like, oh, you know, this makes sense. This might, and like you said, having a different pair of eyes that might not have all the context can always be helpful. Um, question from Kathy. Uh, what is different now that you work as part of a team? I've only ever worked as a solo UX writer, and I don't know what it's like working in a team. It's, it's, it's the dream. <laughs> just because the fact and and we have we have like uh, we call them uh, work in progress sessions once a week that I can bring stuff and we can like nerd out about should this have a hyphen or not it, it's it's amazing because when like my my previous principal designer who I used to work at my previous company he always told me designers need other designers to play just like kids do Mm -hmm. And when you start working with a team that they're on the same wavelength as you are, they have all the information because they're inside the company and they understand what you're talking about. It makes it so much easier because in the end, you might pose one problem in the middle and you have several, in my case, I'm lucky I have several points of view that can help me like get to the right point. So yeah, I, I, if, if you get a chance, go for it. It's, it's, it's lovely to work with a team. Um, so kind of a, um, Julie asks a question about um, being the only UX writer. Um, were you asked to help scale out your writing capabilities? For example, uh, when you do have to say no, that usually means someone else has to do the writing. 
which means non-writers, of course. Have you experienced mentoring others to do a first pass? And if so, how did that go? That, that's a great question, Julie. Thank you. Yes, that makes sense. Um, you'll see that there's people within the company that that been doing the writing for a bit, so they might, so no, they might not. They will have a lot of insight on how to do it, and they'll most likely have the the guide. So yes, in the end, is somebody else has to do the, the writing. So my best advice is like workshop with them, help them on the first few iterations, and then let sort of like let them have a little bit of leeway because it's always going to be easier for you to to sort of like grace through it and have a look rather than doing all the heavy lifting. So that's also something that will prep you up when, when you continue advancing your career, because when you get to a senior position or a lead position or a principal or whatever it may be called, you'll do a lot of this, a lot of coming in. So, okay, so what have you worked on? Let me understand, great. So what, have you tried this? Have you tried that? So this is great practice for that. Um, it looks like we have time for a couple more questions. Um, question from Katie, um, how do you decide uh, what to be involved in and what to let go. Um, I have the problem of trying to get involved in everything. And I think, you know, some of your points that you talked about earlier relate to this, but um, yeah, just if you could uh, talk to us more about this. Sure. Um, thanks for your question, Katie. For me, it's always a balance because you need to understand three things. One, what's the value for the users? Two, what's the business value? Because we don't work, I mean, we work to make money in the end for a company. And three, what is it that you want to do? What interests you? What you are good at? So that means is check first, if you can, with uh, the business. What is the priority? What's based? Everybody has either OKR or some sort of metrics that will map to that. Then check how much this thing is providing value to the users. And third, is it some, from all of this, what are the ones that interest you the most? Once you have those three things, an idea of it, you need to put it together with your manager and your team to better understand how to prioritize. Sometimes you'll get what you want. Sometimes you won't get what you want, but you need to be able to balance that out because if you only work on things that just are not interesting for you or that they're taking away your sleep or they're making you miserable, uh, no bueno. You have to, you have to, you're not in the, you're not in the right place in, in my opinion. So yeah, it's, it's a balancing act. It's not simple. But it's, it's talking, it's conversation, and having the right information in your hands at your disposal. Yeah, well, and, and I think that advice applies to a lot of things, um, work and not work related. Um, our last question is from Somaya. Um, what are the top questions that you ask the designers or UX designers? I, I apologize because my kids are coming in, so you might hear them bounce and scream and maybe sing, so apologies for that. Um, the top five questions are why, 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 and why? Because you need to understand what the interaction is. You need to understand where the information comes from. What did users say? That's about my kid. Um, what's the business value? And what is it that you can do to help them out? So this might vary, but always keep asking why and why and why. Because if you ever listen or if you ever sit around your designers, you'll see when, when there are meeting with more people, that's the question, why? Why, because you need to understand, because again, if you don't understand what the user's needs are, if you don't understand what the business needs are, what stakeholders needs are, you can't design. Of course you can design, but the end product won't be matching those needs. Um, well, thank you so much um, to everyone who has asked questions, and I know there were a couple of questions that we didn't get to, and thank you so much to Mario for answering the questions that came in. Um, our next um, portion of our meetup is, um, is going to be kind of a, a fun group project. Uh, let me share my screen uh, really quickly. Um, so what we are going to be doing is we, um, some technical difficulties, give me just a moment. Um, we will be um, breaking up into groups to create a meme. Um, so our um, our IT uh, Jason will uh, will take the um, the breakup part of it. Um, but in your groups, um, go ahead and um, get to know each other for a little bit. Um, some of you might be the only UX writer. Some of you might be new to this. Some of you uh, might have the luxury of being able to work in teams. 
Um, but in our group, we'll um, go ahead and um, you'll go to the, um, the Filmora um, link, um, and I'll share this, um, this slide in the channel. Um, and you'll uh, find photos to share. You can make text. Um, you'll make your meme. Um, and then go ahead and, uh, and point someone to um, upload the meme that your group creates into the September 2020 Meetup Discussion Slack channel. Um, so we'll have about 10 minutes um, for this activity. Um, and uh, like I said, um, IT will go ahead and break us up into groups and I will um, post this slide in the, in the Slack channel so that way everyone has the link and can start creating the memes. So welcome back. Um, I just checked the uh, September 2020 meetup um, channel in our Slack group and I don't see any memes yet. Um, so if you um, would like to share your meme, um, feel free to post it in the channel. Um, if not, uh, we'll have some opportunities for you to um, talk about the memes that you and your group created. I'll be honest that our team just ended up networking and having a really fun conversation. <laughs> so <laughs> that's more valuable than a meme. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. I really enjoyed talking to you, Chelsea. I mean, Kelsey, excuse me. It was great. Okay. Um, is anyone, would anyone like to kind of talk us through um, uh, maybe their, their meme if, if it needs a little explanation or anyone else um, like to share the success of their breakout room, whether or not it was creating a meme? My group, we had a lot of fun. We did network and then we did try to get the meme done really fast and I'm literally just figuring out the tool and I'll be done in like, 30 seconds? <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Where do you want us to drop? How do we drop? Yeah, if you just want to paste it in the um, September 2020 meetup discussion um, channel in the Slack group. I don't have Slack. Uh, I am on a company computer and I cannot connect to that Slack group here. Okay. <laughs> They're very tight. Yeah, well, maybe uh, someone else in your group uh, might be able to post that. Um, yeah, just send it to me and... Um, okay, I'll send it to you. And I'll post it. Oh, uh, yeah, well, it looks like there's some, some memes posted in the channel um, that relate to, um, you know, the struggle is real or cookies. Um, and it sounds like there will be some more memes that will be coming into the Slack channel. Um, and whether or not your group created a meme or just had valuable networking time, um, one of the um, something that sets the San Francisco UX writers made up apart um, is the opportunity to network and connect with other people. Um, and we're glad that we're able to do that still um, and now on an international scale. Um, so um, before we close out, I want to give a big shout out and thank you to Jason for um, his tech support throughout this. Um, and again, uh, thank you to Indeed for sponsoring um, this event. Uh, we will have another event next month, uh, Wednesday, October 21st at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Um, that might, time might be different depending on where you are. Uh, Caroline Paracci from Zurich, Switzerland will be um, talking to us about how content drives conversion. And in November, we are looking forward to having Yael Ben David from Israel come and speak to us. Um, the, Slack space, the Slack workspace is available for you to use and connect with other people. Um, even after this meetup concludes. Um, and so please continue using it even if there's not an event. Um, take care and we will see you next time. Gracias for coming. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Mario. And thank, thank you, you Catherine and Kirsten for having me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your biggest fan. <laughs>